ACPA College Student Educators International is the leading comprehensive student affairs association that advances higher education and engages students for a lifetime of learning and discovery. Although serving an international audience, our membership is primarily from the United States and our offices are headquartered in Washington, D.C. at the National Center for Higher Education. Related to our mission of supporting and fostering learning through the generation and dissemination of knowledge, ACPA acknowledges the painful history of genocide in the United States for Native, Aboriginal, and Indigenous peoples. We honor and respect the many and diverse tribal nations and peoples who were forcefully removed from, as well as those still connected to, this land. We particularly acknowledge and recognize that the land upon which our international headquarters is located today has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous people, including the Akahanic, Pocomoke, Piscataway, Anacostank, Metapaniant, Nagumek, Pumunki, Tawhihent, Nanticoke, Chickahominy, Manukin, Mataponi, Nansimund, Rappahannock, Anistohini, Umnami, and Assateague tribal nations as the original occupants of the Washington, D.C. regions. ACPA strongly advocates for higher education and student affairs professionals to honor the land, the original tribal occupants, and the history of the people where you are located. Further, we have a responsibility to continually self-educate, reflect, and listen to the histories and people in our areas. Including tribal land acknowledgements and practice and understanding and acknowledging history is not only respectful and educational, it is the justice-oriented advocacy necessary for continuing the work of dismantling the devastating effects of settler colonialism in our society. The ACPA Generativity Project was created in 2012 to begin documenting the history of ACPA and the student affairs profession in video format under the leadership of 1985 to 1986 past president Dr. Dennis C. Roberts. The first set of videos produced were interviews with Esther Lloyd-Jones, Art Chickering, Melvine Hardy, and Nevitt Sanford. The project was extended to include existing videos from the archives that had been previously recorded in the 1980s and 1990s. ACPA has made these historic videos available to ACPA members online through the ACPA member portal. Simply click the resources tab. As we approach ACPA's 100th anniversary in 2024, we are continuing the work started by Dr. Roberts to ensure that we have captured the association's and profession's history from a number of important dimensions. It is our hope that we will produce two new videos per year leading up to our 100th anniversary to add to this amazing resource. ACPA acknowledges that this video has been produced and distributed through technology that may not be readily accessible to all members. Often referred to as the digital divide, we acknowledge that ready access to employment or wealth that provides computers, internet, or other technologies is not available to everyone who may benefit from the wisdom and information shared in this video project. Upon request, we are willing to provide a written transcript of this video interview. Please email info at acpa.nche.edu. We would like to thank our presenters for today's Generativity Project. Ann Pruitt, 1976 to 1977 president, 37th president, first African-American female president. Harold Cheatham, 1995 to 1996 president, 56th president, and first African-American male president. Gregory Roberts, 1999 to 2000 president, 60th president, second African-American male president, and former executive director. Paul Shang, 2002 to 2003 president, 63rd president, first Asian-American president. Vasti Torres, 2007 to 2008 president, 68th president, and first Latinx president. Stephen John Quay, 2017 to 2018 president, 78th president, and fourth African-American male president. And Jamie Washington, 2018 to 2019 president, 79th president, and fifth African-American male president. This project specifically is celebrating the past and present uh, African-American, Asian-American, and Latinx ACPA presidents. And so it is my absolute honor um, to be um, with some of those uh, very powerful and important leaders who um, helped to shape our profession down over this last 95, going on 96 years. And you're gonna to get to hear from some of those folks today. Um, I will um, name all of them and then um, invite you to get to meet some of them uh, during this interview. 
So we've got um, Dr. Ann Pruitt, who was our 37th president, Dr. Harold Cheatham, who was our 56th president, uh, Greg Roberts, who was our 60th president, Paul Shang, who was our 63rd president, uh, Vasti Torres, who was our 68th president, Mary Howard, who was our 38th president, Marlene Hughes, who was our 48th president, Tom Jackson, who was our 70th president, Stephen Quay, who was our 78th president, Jamie Washington, myself, who was a 79th president, and Donna Lee, who was our 77th president. Um, a few folks will not be able to join us in this conversation in, in the persons of Mary Howard, Marveline Stiles, Tom Jackson, and Donna Lee, but I did want to name them that they are a part of this group of presidents of color of ACPA. I'm gonna hand off now to Dr. Stephen John Quay to set us up for our interviews. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to be here today with some of our past presidents of ACPA. Um, and so to get us going, um, what would be helpful is for each of us to spend a little bit of time um, more formally introducing ourselves um, um, and then also talking about the context within higher education and or ACPA during our time as a leader. Um, and so the specific question here is what were one or two pressing issues of the time and then how did race or ethnicity connect with those issues or with your role as a leader? And again, I'll ask each of you to chronologically introduce yourself and then if you could spend some time responding to any of those questions and then we will continue moving forward. And so to kick us off, um, I'm gonna go to Ann Pruitt um, to start us off. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to have to, to have been able to look back on what was going on uh, during that time. I consider myself having been introduced to this field in 1949. <coughs> That's probably before some of you were born. <laughs> because I met Esther Lloyd Jones. I met, I met I, I, people like Ruth Strang people who were the leaders, the creators of our association. And I stayed with the field until just a few years ago. Um, I'm now retired, uh, have been retired for quite a while and have been living in Florida for quite a while. Um, for me, quite a while is five years. Um, but ACPA had a trem tremendous impact on me in that it gave me the opportunity to try to insert the student into the administration of colleges and universities. Um, it came at a, my, my election as president came at a time when the United States was awash with concerns about underrepresented racial groups in higher education, as well as the underrepresentation of women in fields that in fields in which men dominated. So I did research, I did writing, I did teaching in these two large aspects of higher education, what I saw as higher education's problems. Um, it needed to work on equal opportunity for people from all racial groups. It needed to work on opportunities for women. And so I thank you for the opportunity to, to have done that. 
and I pass it on now to the next person. So the next person then would be Harold. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very delighted to be with you colleagues uh, to share these reminiscences of our history as minority African-American, Latinx, and um, people of color leading the association. Um, my introduction to ACPA uh, came when some of those leaders whom Dr. Pruitt has just spoken of were still afoot. I will remember the first time I was standing in a conference and turned around and looked at a tag and it said, C. Gilbert Wren on the name tag. <laughs> I was just totally intimidated and blown away. I was going like, he's here? <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that was an immersion for me actually into the professional association to actually move from where I had been in uh, a, a teacher of social studies, actually moving into the field of counseling and back to my undergraduate uh, fo foci uh, when I became the uh, student of Dr. Pruitt in the early 70s. Uh, I retired in 1996. I'm, I'm sorry, I came here to Clemson in 1996 as dean of the college. And effectively, that uh, moved me out of student affairs and into academic administration stream. I retired in 2001, so I'm uh, getting close to two decades of being on the periphery of student affairs, but having made efforts to keep up with what we are doing. Uh, my presidency in ACPA was, I think, most interesting uh, simply because it was the days when we were, uh, when we had tried several times, I think, to uh, form other uh, associations together with one or two other higher ed associations and had failed. And ultimately the decision was made a few years before my presidency to actually bite the bullet and disaffiliate with AC, APGA uh, becoming a, an, an independent uh, uh, student affairs, student personnel uh, organization. Uh, there was, those were heady times and uh, very exciting because I hadn't ever been in a place where people worked together with such a cooperative spirit. And during my time in the presidency, as I said in some of my introductory comments, I really never felt like I was the president of ACPA. And I don't mean that in the pejorative sense, uh, because we really were a team. We had lots of serious work to get done, to hold our uh, membership together, to uh, stop the, the leakage as ACA was forming and draining off uh, uh, many of our members uh, to that uh, association. So the integrity and um, uh, lifeblood of ACPA was the critical thing. And so during my uh, time, uh, I really feel like we were, were more of a panel of presidents uh, I had all kinds of support, as I said, from Leela and Paul and Chuck Schroeder and um, Terry Williams, the people who immediately preceded me in the presidency. We did uh, much of my administration in a totally wholly consultative way where we decided what we would present to the membership about uh, appointing an executive director and creating a job description and uh, figuring out how to do our conferences and conventions independently and so on. And so it was just a very wonderful time uh, for me as a professional. And uh, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not discrediting myself, but I didn't aspire to the presidency. I was kind of surprised when one of our senior colleagues who never was a president of the association, but was a real spark plug 
uh, pulling people together, came up to me and said, uh, we have some healing to do in ACPA with this disaffiliation, and I think you're the person to lead that. So here I was, here I am, thank you. Great, thank you, Harold. Um, Gregory Roberts. Well, let me say uh, again, it's uh, uh, an honor to be a part of an association that always stood for justice. And uh, when I was reflecting back on, number one, this would be my 20th year since I served as president, uh, 1999, 2000, with the convention being held in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was a very uh, difficult time uh, as a country. Uh, the impeaching, the impeachment uh, proceedings uh, with Bill Clinton uh, and his acquittal and the Columbine uh, massacre, which began a whole different approach for higher education and our collaborative partnership with uh, K-12. Um, but I, I think we all somewhat stumbled on, or at least I stumbled on the presidency. Uh, Terry Williams asked me to uh, handle the money of the association. It was a continuation of uh, Harold's uh, group. Uh, and I think whether we uh, agreed with each other, we always sided on what was best for the association and uh, dealing with issues of uh, sexism and racism, uh, gender issues, uh, ACPA was always stepping out on faith. And uh, as we look back 20 years and say, thank God ACPA did take those risks and those steps. Uh, and unfortunately, in my opinion, we're back to where we started in many cases uh, that this country has, uh, has got to address. And so the call for student life folks is back where we were 20 years ago. So I could go on and on, but uh, I think the important thing is uh, the collaboration that Harold talked about. And it's not about us as individuals, it's about us as a collective people. Uh, and the beauty of an organization that was always accused of being on the edge. Uh, and I mean negatively, uh, some of our own colleagues and other associations. Uh, but when it all came, we were uh, aware of what the students' needs were and took bold steps to see how we could address those. And I can tell you, I, I, 20 years ago, I would not have thought I would be sitting where I am today, although it was a part of my goal to finish my career on a campus, uh, working with uh, students to see how, in fact, that has transpired over the 45 years uh, that I've been on the forefront. So it's been a challenge, it's been a, a joy. Uh, and to follow uh, Mary and Ann and Harold, uh, the, the four, um, there were four, uh, Ann and Mary and Harold. And Marveline. And Marveline, that's right. So that's enough. <laughs> All right, thank you, Greg. Paul, you're up next. Uh, thank you. And <clears throat> I have to say, it's just wonderful to hear um, all the different commentaries. And uh, the, these are people that, uh, all of you are people that I really enjoyed working with um, in ACPA and and, men, and you were confidants uh, for me. And uh, it's just lovely to, to have this opportunity to hear um, our stories. Um, <clears throat> ACPA has always been an organization that, that stood for inclusion. Um, Greg is right, we've, we've always been kind of on the edge. And uh, I, I would anticipate that uh, that's something that we will always try to do because we forward a perspective and, and we promote a vision. Um, sometimes this might be 
not what the majority is, is pursuing, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's an important uh, voice and an important theme. So um, I had the pleasure of being the affirmative action officer uh, for Charles Schroeder and Barbara Anderson, culminating with uh, Harold. And uh, we promoted actually growing ACPA and growing ACPA in ways um, that some people found to be rather controversial. We actually had goals uh, in terms of, of recruiting <laughs> LGBTQ people and, and people of color. And uh, we had a statement that we passed uh, under Harold's presidency uh, called People Get Ready. Now, I don't know, you know, what has happened since then. I'm sure there have been many other affirmative action plans and, and or uh, even if there's any conversations about not necessarily affirmative action, but I know that there have been conversations about inclusion and diversity and wanting to make sure that ACPA would always be a welcoming organization for people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And I was thrilled to be a part of that. Um, I, like some others, did not expect to be ACPA president. As a matter of fact, um, I came from, to the profession uh, really from, from a, a different uh, sort of perspective. I was steeped in uh, what we used to refer to as minority affairs or, or diversity kind of work. I was a member of MAOP, which is the Midwestern Association of Equal Opportunity Professionals. Um, I worked with TRIO programs um, and did work in minority affairs offices, quote unquote. Um, and my academic background was not in student affairs, it was in philosophy. It was Ursa Delworth and uh, Cynthia Johnson and Laura Makanyo Shang who got me to my first ACPA convention, which was the joint which, uh, with uh, NASPA in Chicago. And uh, I had just such a wonderful time that ACPA then became my main association and, and my, that was the one that I stayed with. Uh, and years later, people asked me if I would run uh, for the presidency. And I, I said, well, sure, but I didn't expect to win. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it worked out that I did. And during our, my presidency, it, uh, we wanted to grow the association. Uh, we were in Minneapolis. Uh, Greg introduced me to a number of wonderful, wonderful colleagues. Um, and we had uh, what I consider to be a really great convention. It was fun to do and, and we had a good time. But the, the issue for us is, is, first of all, back then was to recognize our diversity, try to enhance it within the association, try to be much more inclusive in terms of, of who we were talking about. It was people of color, it was, it was people with disabilities, it was LGBTQ people, um, but it was also other people that, that were doing student affairs work um, that perhaps we did not really have strong ties with and how to bring them into the association or to work with them to create a stronger, more encompassing sort of perspective. That included community college people, uh, that included uh, academic advising folks, that included orientation people. And, and I think to a certain extent that, that kind of thing continues. And, and that was the, the sort of, of perspective that we had uh, back then in, in 2002, 2003. Um, so uh, what is going on now is, is very enlightening for me and I'm no longer on a campus. I know that the students have changed. I think that the discussions which actually are discussions that we've had before, perhaps are a little bit more uh, pointed than they once were. Uh, perhaps as Greg points out and as others of you have mentioned, you know, it's maybe a more crucial time in certain respects along those lines. And, and I'm glad to see that, that ACPA is, is continuing to assume leadership of this kind of conversation. Um, so I'm happy that, uh, to be included in this, in this call and, and it's so good to see so many colleagues. And the one thing that we did uh, in my presidency that was, that was um, 
perhaps controversial. Uh, perhaps it was something that we needed to do. Um, and I talked this over a lot with Greg and, and also with Harold and, and others. And this was the notion of, you know, should we go ahead and, and try to uh, form one association with NASPA? The opportunity <laughs> came up to have that conversation. Um, and I decided to go ahead and take it. Um, and it was with some guidance and people's concerns. Um, but I thought at the time that it was, a, it was an important conversation to have. Um, I regret that it took up the time of many other presidents after me, uh, <laughs> but it, it was something that I think was important for us to have and, and we've moved on. Thanks. Thank you. Basti, you're next. Uh, hello, I'm Vasti Torres, and I was ACPA president between 2007 and 2008. Um, and I think uh, I came to the presidency reluctantly, but at the same time um, remembered that when I was a young professional, I was one of the people who started the Latino network. And there were about eight people around the table at that time. <laughs> And one of the goals that we had set for the Latino Network is to um, go into the leadership of the association eventually. So when I was asked to run, um, it was time to walk the talk. Um, so I accepted the invitation. Um, my presidency was uh, quite eventful to some degree. Uh, I ended up having to implement the new organizational structure that was passed before me. And it was somewhat controversial um, and yet ideal uh, that someone like me became president because um, it shifted the role of standing committees within the association. And the standing committees represented the social identities of our members. And so it was a, um, a delicate conversation and walk of making sure that our roots um, with uh, respect for social identities were respected, uh, but that we were also needing to function as a large organization that had matured in different ways. Um, so it was, it was challenging in that way. Um, I will say that uh, um, the sort of contextual piece of what we did when I was president um, was start the Future of Student Affairs Task Force with NASPA. Um, it was the first time that we had a joint task force where neither association had representatives, but both associations voted on all representatives. Um, and it actually went to a vote, um, which did garner the majority of votes, but not quite enough um, on the NASPA side. Um, but it, it provided a document that really um, focused the kinds of things that we need to think about. Um, the other thing that I'm most proud of was that uh, my conference was the first time we started using professional competencies and outcomes to organize the program. Um, and part of that had to do with two faculty members as president and program chair. Um, but it's, it's been something that has been maintained. And I think it's a helpful way for uh, practitioners and scholars to consider what they want to look at. Um, from a societal point of view, uh, I was president during the Virginia Tech um, attack, which was also uh, a major milestone uh, within higher education and, and the idea that something like that could never happen on campus. Um, so it, it in, engaged us in very different kinds of conversations about response, um, which now is, uh, since I'm still a faculty member at the University of Virginia, you know, alerts that come regularly, um, uh, active shooter responses, uh, training. So it's very much of who we are in higher education today, but it was really a shocking event at the time it happened. Um, so that was my presidency. Um, I will say that one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of ACPA is that they created these stickers that said, yo soy ACPA. <laughs> 
um, during my presidency. And it was great. They were incredibly popular. Everybody wanted a Yo Soy ACPA, including people that I'm not sure knew what it meant. Um, so it was, it was lovely to um, do that. And uh, it, I still have some. I, I've kept those. They were very important to me. So it was, a, it was a pleasure to serve, and I was glad when it was over. Great, thank you. Um, so I think I am next. Um, so again, Stephen Quay, and I served as ACPA president um, 2017, 2018. Um, so sort of my foray into ACPA started as a master's student um, being encouraged to go to a conference and I just kept going back since then. Um, and so um, since then, I think roles that I've been involved in. So my most recent role before president was I was co-chair of NextGen um, in whenever ACP was in, in the 2014, 15, somewhere around there. Um, and it was during this conference where um, ACPA had a close, two closing speakers who could not speak at the um, at the convention. Um, so um, Laverne Cox was slated to be the one of the closing speakers, um, was not able to be present. And so Michael Sam was then asked and was not able to be present as well. And so it was at that conference where I gave one of the closing um, addresses um, while I was also co-chair of NextGen. And so it was a very uh, busy conference, but I think it was that moment that really, I think, prompted me to think a lot about um, more leadership in ACPA. Um, and then just watching the ways in which um, Donna Lee was president when I was vice president, just watching the ways in which Donna led with such, I think, grace and compassion um, as a Black woman was really also powerful for me. Um, and so that's really what um, I think situated me in a lot of the work that um, I did as ACPA president. Um, so as I think of sort of the, the larger context during that time, um, so this was also, we had just come off the 2016 presidential election. Um, in our society, there was also continued um, police violence towards black and brown people. Um, and so I just felt a sense of palpable pain um, among people of color um, within the association um, like they were really, really struggling, um, feeling hurt, trauma, um, afraid, living daily in fear of their black and brown bodies. And so um, it was during that time that we as, as, as an association wanted to prioritize and center um, racial justice in the association. Um, and so that's where the original iteration of the strategic imperative for racial justice came to be. Uh, much like, um, you know, Greg, Harold, um, and, and Paul and others have said, um, ACPA has been on the leading edge of, 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 of these pieces, and this was a, another moment for us to lead in this way. Um, and so I'm grateful for that opportunity. Um, shortly after we decided to prioritize racial justice, and this was a key learning moment for me as, as president, um, we realized in the process that not everyone identifies um, with racial justice and race um, in the same ways. Um, and so we had excluded some of the particular experiences of native aboriginal and indigenous peoples by not including a, a strict attention to um, colonization and how that um, impacts their particular experiences uniquely. And so um, through, that, through hearing that feedback is when we decided to um, extend the racial justice and also be mindful of and include decolonization into that piece, as, into the imperative as well. Um, and so that was, again, a, a response to be more inclusive, to hear feedback, which is what I think I value about the association, is it makes it hard at times. And I also appreciate that people feel that they're able to give feedback and that that feedback will actually be used to do something um, different. And so that to me was a really learning, a big learning moment for me. And also one of the things that I'm the most proud of as uh, during my time as, as president. 
Um, and so again, we, we wanted to respond to the student activism that was happening on our campuses, respond to the pain that was coming from folks um, coming off the 2016 election. Um, and our effort to do that was to center and prioritize racial justice and decolonization in the association. Um, and that still lives on today. And I'm super pleased of the document that several folks and I um, authored as well around the topic. Um, and, um, and I continue to hear folks talking about that and using it in their work. And that to me is what gives me hope for uh, making our world better than um, than we entered it, and so, so yeah. So that's just a little bit about I think what um, brought me here today. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you all. And I guess I'm up next as the most um, immediate past president um, of the association. And um, <clears throat> again, as we kind of look across the years and generations, and when I entered the association in 1984, it was, again, um, the, I think, while we have been actively engaged uh, for many years of, um, since, um, and uh, Anne was naming the importance of inclusion of minoritized voices and the voices of, uh, minoritized by race voices and the voices of women, that we had uh, been actively doing that. Um, I come in at the time when there is a, a particular focus around how we get those voices in governing board leadership. Uh, such standing committee leaders were moving on to the governing board um, at that time. Um, so establishment of voice and agency around women, around uh, 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 CMA, multicultural affairs, as well as um, LGB at the time um, awareness. Um, and then disabilities to follow and, and, and continue. So identity-based voices um, are where I entered and the space that I found as home. Um, as the, at that time, the chair of the Standing Committee for LGBT and the first chair of color um, in, in that space. And so um, the uh, continuing through the years, participating um, and committed to the association around in, in several ways as member at large and so on. And then I come into the presidency um, at a time when I actually was invited to, um, to the presidency, as I said in my introductions, I, I thought again, as, as I got clear that my work in higher education was gonna look different than I thought it was, um, and that I would be serving it in a different way as a, a consultant and trainer to higher ed, and that got clear in the time I was in seminary, um, 2001 to 2003, 2004, that um, I was, you know, I really felt like I was serving the association in a different way, that I wasn't going to step into formal leadership. I was doing programs, I was on the foundation board, I was doing all kinds of other things and wasn't necessarily looking to, thinking about going into the presidency. Um, and in 2016, right as the racial justice um, imperative was named um, uh, and the election of current uh, President Trump happened and the impact of that um, at, at the national level, um, I was invited to, to run for president. Uh, I initially said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, I don't know if you all didn't know I wasn't on a campus, so that can't happen. So I said, no, because that's what I thought was, was, was the case. And um, I remember Gavin Henney called me back and says, I don't know anything about that. Why, why would you not be able to run president because you're not on the campus? I said, well, that's in the bylaws, you know. <laughs> so he said, no, no, it's not. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, darn it. <laughs> So he called back and so then I had to really think about what it meant for me to step into leadership in this way at that time. And it was working um, and watching kind of the time that we were in uh, as well as the opportunity to work with, uh, I think similarly to what Harold said, this is a powerful leadership team of Donna Lee and uh, Stephen Quay. And so, and then we had this trio of African-American presidents that had not ever happened in the history. And so 
that felt like a very, very important moment. And so I come in, the racial justice imperative was named uh, in 2016. Uh, we began to uh, uh, kind of begin to actualize that. The first convention of that being actualized um, fully was the 2017 convention, um, the 2018 convention uh, under um, uh, Stevens leadership. And that's the first convention where we had identity-based caucuses. Um, uh, and race, you know, identity-based, race-based caucuses to invite um, deeper work around racial justice and decolonization. And, and then the 2019 convention, which was my convention, is the 95th anniversary convention where we were really looking at um, the importance of why uh, in what does this all mean for us as a profession? And how do we begin to kind of show up as the leaders on our campuses that um, our organizations, that our campuses need at the time? So that how we could show that student affairs preparation um, prepared us with the skills and the tools to help our campuses move through and navigate the challenges of today's campuses particularly through a racial justice and decolonization lens. Uh, and so that's kind of how I've come to uh, the space and have spent these last uh, three years um, and prior to that, but in the leadership, really kind of helping us to move into and um, as my friend um, Stephen would say, concretize what it means to focus on racial justice and decolonization as a lens through which we do all of our work. With that named, I want to thank you all for kind of just kind of framing that and just want to invite us into um, this, this question here around the noticing about how we feel like in our presidencies, um, race matter. Did, did we feel like that that was present? Um, and connected to that is the, there have been large gaps in uh, presidency uh, in this, in this um, full 95, almost 96 years, um, not unlike our country, um, we've had um, only, uh, as, as of this year, 12 uh, presidents of color. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it can look like a lot if you don't consider all the years, right? Um, uh, but as you as, as as we think about think about that for for nearly eighty three to eighty four years um, of this association, there's not been representation by people of color. So any thoughts about the gaps or how race mattered or showed up during your presidency? Um, and I'll just invite any of us to who's kind of ready to jump in there to go ahead and do that. Anybody in particular? I appreciate Vashi, Vashi named the importance and the significance of being the first Latinx president, a Latina president, and why, as you enter the profession, how that mattered, right? Um, uh, so, but uh, during your time as president, um, kind of spoken and unspoken is what we're inviting into the conversation. Well, one well, of the things that uh, strikes me. Um, among all of us was the consistency about um, forefronting issues of race and ethnicity within ACPA. Um, and while it's always been a value, I'm not sure it's always been forefronted. So um, I think it's, it, it's kind of seen that way. During my presidency, uh, there were um, a few things that uh, really had to be forefronted. And I remember in my opening address at the National Convention actually making the comment um, that if you are a member of ACPA, it is not an option to do nothing. Um, that we are obligated to address these issues. And the kinds of things that emerged uh, during the restructuring uh, process and the reorganizing um, I, I, as I reflected on this, I would 
put this in two areas. One is the sense of loss of power uh, by the standing committees, which was very real. Um, yet it, you know, it, it took a lot of effort to make sure that we were continuing to incorporate their voice at the table. Uh, and the second thing was the, um, the fear of having the conversation or of addressing people directly on what it is that they were concerned about. And um, frankly, I, I didn't understand or share that fear. So ended up having wonderful conversations um, and we ended up celebrating um, standing committee anniversaries uh, during the convention. And um, I think it, it was uh, addressing it head on and really engaging in the conversation that both felt natural to me, but I think what helped uh, transition uh, the kinds of things that were happening in the association. Anyone else want to get in? Got time for a couple more. In terms of the role that race played. Well, I think in, in my tenure, uh, race has always been an issue. When I looked at that question and thought back, uh, no matter how good things seemingly were, uh, and again, during the Bill Clinton era, uh, you know, some people said we had uh, our first black president. I heard people use that, and I always thought, well, we need to step back a minute. But uh, I don't care whether it was the collaboration within ACPA or the collaboration outside of ACPA with other associations, uh, race mattered. Uh, and you just learn to pick and choose your battles, but uh, it, it was not a surprise, uh, but I think there was positive steps forward. Uh, a lot of the work dating uh, when Harold was doing a lot of the media and writing uh, in terms of minority counseling and the issues that surface around minorities in the counseling arena, which I thought uh, historically would have been mostly uh, some Caucasian. But regardless of how close we were or how serious we were, race still was an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. Um, and I thought it was really important uh, to be able to, to try to acknowledge the concerns within the association of wanting to be more welcoming and to be more inclusive and to have it as one of our goals to actually recruit more people of color, more LGBTQ people, and more people uh, with, with disabilities uh, because we wanted to be a representative student affairs association. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought it was very important. And for me personally, <clears throat> as the first Asian American uh, mm -hmm. president, I, I wanted to be a good role model and I wanted to, to use my presidency as a way to, to encourage other people to think about uh, taking le uh, positions of, of leadership. Um, during my convention, we, uh, our suite hosted uh, CMA, the Committee on Multicultural Affairs, mm -hmm. reception, Standing Committee for Women, their reception, and, and tried to reach out to younger members to talk about one of the strengths of ACPA, which is very welcoming of new ideas and new people and, and a good place to practice your leadership skills and to hone them. Um, so I was hoping that, that this would encourage people to, to think about assuming leadership positions uh, when at that particular time anyway, I wasn't um, a, a senior student affairs professional. I mean, I became one during my presidency, uh, but prior to my time, everybody had been, you know, a, a dean of students or a vice president for student affairs or a faculty member. 
Um, and I, I wasn't from that particular background. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm getting ready to betray a colossal naivety about race and its role in ACPA. Uh, when I read the question about the role that race played, I had to spend a lot of time reflecting on that. I had been very, very active in the uh, development of the Association for Non-White Concerns. Remember ANWIC and APGA? Uh, I was very active in that. And so when the ACPA was made the decision to separate out, it seemed like to me that those issues that we were addressing in ANWIC uh, were really less intense. I, uh, the only racial reference that I could come to, I remember somebody who complained loudly and bitterly, and I think almost singularly uh, about the prospect of having two black women succeed uh, themselves in, in, in the presidency. When uh, Mary Howard uh, was announced as a candidate for presidency to follow Dr. Pruitt. Uh, I got an apology from one of our peers about the ignorance of someone who raised the question, what, what will ACPA look like if we have a succession of black presidents? I don't think the question ever was raised again. Uh, it didn't, uh, I, 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 it wasn't raised to my awareness is what I mean to say. Uh, it didn't gain any traction and I think it caused embarrassment for people because it was so contrary to what we were standing for and about in ACPA. Um, I, would be, I would be interested to hear if there are experiences of people that being, I mean, made to feel as if they were outsiders because of the character, uh, distinguishing differences in their uh, character, personality, uh, their person. Uh, ACPA seemed to me to be the most accepting and uh, open organization that there maybe was in the universe, it certainly was in my experience. And so uh, I'm happy to say, although I say maybe I reveal a colossal uh, naivete that it never even was a consideration in whether I would uh, accept the encouragement to run for the presidency. Race wasn't, wasn't an issue at all. It was about competency to lead this organization and to embrace and promote uh, the, 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 the um, enunciated values of the association. Thank you. Um, I, t I did just want to jump in. Um, one of the things that um, kind of stood out to me around how race has shown up down through the years is one of the ways that we, uh, I recognize that we try to kind of, um, you know, kind of create that welcoming and inviting space was through our conventions um, at our openings. So I remember very distinctly um, there being jazz groups or there being dancers or there being um, choirs. Um, that represented, you know, kind of uh, across race, um, often minoritized racialized experiences um, at the opening of the convention um, that might invite folks into experiences as, that they hadn't had, that they might not necessarily go to on their campuses, uh, but that having that experience at their national convention might then invite them to go to when the gospel choir is having their concert or when um, the APA group is having an event that, um, that, that we can be in this, that this is for all of our learning and all of our benefit. Um, and so um, that was just, as you all were talking, I was thinking about conventions and always remembering as I went to convention, what was the opening going to be, right? And um, how diverse it was going to be and representative and, who are we going to see and who aren't we going to see? Um, so that was one of the things that just popped for me. I think this is a good segue into um, a specific question around the 
um, racial justice and decolonization um, part that ACPA has centered. Um, so, um, so ACPA has, has centralized racial justice and decolonization as a primary topic facing higher education today. Um, so I'm curious if some of you can respond to the question, um, what are your thoughts and reactions to the strategic imperative and what role does ACPA have in addressing racism, white supremacy and Western colonization? As we have sought to um, provide leadership in the profession, I think that it is more critical at the present moment than maybe ever in my lifetime for the association to have a clear and strong stand on racial justice and equity uh, with the uh, just flagrant promotion of hate and discontent and racism and, and ill-tempered behavior toward anyone who doesn't look like you uh, as, as kind of a dominant theme every day in our American society. I, I'm confident that the association is on the right track with having adopted this focus. It isn't even having adopted it. We've always had it from my perspective. Uh, it's a matter of homing in on it from time to time in response to the larger society. So uh, I think that we're on the right track. And I think that uh, because as I have experienced it uh, through, the, through the years, uh, successive administrations will maintain a crisp focus on that as long as it is needed, but never ever letting it go thinking that the work is, has been completed. I'd like to add some history to this conversation about uh, ACPA and racism. Back in the 1950s, I was invited to join the Southern College Personnel Association because I worked in a little college in Albany, Georgia. The person who was head of that group was Mel Hardy. And uh, we wanted to meet in Miami, Florida. And we were dis discovered, she discovered, that we were not allowed to meet there. And we were not allowed to stay in the hotel as an interracial group. And therefore, we did not go to that particular hotel. And she took the stand that this group Southern College Personnel Association would not ever meet in a location where segregation existed. Now, I, I, I cite this incident because <clears throat> it takes forcefulness and leadership from individual members themselves to come up and take the reins and to give the leadership to doing something about this process of this problem in our country. And that was Mel Hardy's role at that time, the 1950s. That, that jogs my, my recollection also of pride in that because I distinctly remember our convention in New Orleans in probably 1969, 70, 71, too, somewhere along in there, and our convention in Atlantic City when the association took a very strong stand against existing racism and inequity in the workforce before we went to um, Atlantic City for the convention, whatever year it was in the early 70s or late, late 60s, we had a, a signed agreement from the association about the uh, treatment of workers and fair, fair, fair pay, etc. And I just I recall that in about the 1969 or 70 convention that occurred in New Orleans, the same thing occurred about workers and equity and so on. So that the association seems to me to have been mindful throughout its history, at least in its modern history, <laughs> to uh, assure that we didn't go to cities where people were you know, openly 
oppressed and mistreated and so on without having spoken to it, uh, coming there and, and spending our money and whatever without uh, attending to the conditions of the local community. I want to add, um, and I completely agree <laughs> um, about the, the kinds of things that we've done as an association. I want to remind everybody, ironically, um, that we moved a whole convention from out of Arizona to Miami, you know, because of, of concerns that we had about that state. And, and I believe it was over the, whether or not their refusal to adopt Martin Luther King Day. Was it Dr. Martin Luther King Day? Yeah. And I, I think that was very, yep. very important. And, and that, that is part of the history of our association. Um, and, and I'm very proud of that. I just want to say that, that um, <clears throat> with regard to the racial justice and decolonization um, idea being centralized, um, I think that that's really important. And I think to one extent or another, all of us in ACPA and, and the association itself has always promoted uh, a, a full conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think this is a continuation of that. And this is where not having been to a convention in several years, I think is, is really a detriment in terms of my perspective and my understanding um, of the centrality of this idea. I mean, <clears throat> we are a student affairs association and this is an incredibly important topic and I don't deny it. As a matter of fact, I embrace it. However, you know, at our conventions and in our literature and everything else that's important about ACPA, we, we need to be able to emphasize and speak to the whole student experience. Um, and that, that's where, you know, when I read the press and I read critiques about what has happened at our association and and you know these are not well intended in any way and probably not accurate my concern is, is is are we speaking to the concerns of the other student affairs practitioners out there and, and their college experiences um it seems to me that that i know for a fact in the three years that i've been gone it the things have changed dramatically on campus and there is a plethora of all kinds of different other issues that have emerged, freedom of speech, sexual assault, you know, even access to college um, and preparation of students before they get to college. All of this is, is very, very important. So that's, that's the only small concern because I know it's being handled probably much better than I can even imagine. But I do want to say that, that that's something that would cause me to just be a little anxious about the centrality of this particular notion. I, I want to chime in and, and thank uh, Dr. Cheatham, Dr. Pruitt for sharing the historical pieces, uh, because I think it's so important to realize that within our lifetime, we have been struggling with this for so long, and it's a, it's a critical piece. I want to um, share an experience I had that uh, sort of explains my reaction. Sorry, that was very Latina. I have to use my hands. Um, but uh, I, a, a recent, I attended a, a lecture um, as Division J post-secondary vice president for ARA. I attended the Brown lecture, which was delivered by Prudence Carter. And she entitled it, um, a shade less offensive. And it was in reference to the Supreme Court decision to desegregate rather than um, create equality. That desegregation was a shade less offensive. Um, and I think sometimes, and I will own this myself, sometimes we have chosen a shade less offensive, which has not been as direct as it should be. And I've really appreciated um, the decolonization efforts as not being a shade less offensive and direct to the point. And so I, it, it, it struck me as our time to be 
a little bit more focused on equality rather than being a shade less offensive. Thank, thank you um, all for that, um, Basi. That that just very powerful um, to me as we think about us as an association boldly transforming higher education, um, and not to just be a shade less offensive. That really matters, um, and uh, uh, really appreciating because um, the last Paul's your your comments um, that takes us to this last thing around you know kind of navigating critique. Right, and how we manage the how people see and read and um, understand this notion of uh, racial justice and decolonization as a centralized piece um, that has not, as again, so beautifully, um, Anne and Harold names this not new, right, to us. And that what we know and what I've experienced in higher education is that, um, that we are inviting us to the next level of the conversation. Um, and so be, beyond, um, again, desegregation, right? Um, be, beyond just creating space at the table, but uh, now really kind of looking at how the table got formed, right? And who gets to set the agenda or the menu at the table and how we have to kind of reevaluate all that we do and do all of that through a racial justice and decolonized lens. Not that we don't need to continue to pay attention to how we um, look at that through the lens of patriarchy and sexism and heterosexism and cisgender stuff. All of those things matter. And some would name that we've probably moved further along in some of those areas than we have around the issue of race given our context. Um, and so one of the things that I would just invite us into as we move to the last part of our time together is how we've managed um, and navigated critique um, in, in, in our work, uh, particularly as uh, folks of color and how that uh, in our leadership in, in ACPA. So, uh, the, you know, criticism and critique, you know, kind of navigating the differences in that and how we've internalized critiques and criticisms um, can be uh, even more difficult. So just want to give anyone who wants to check in around or enter around how they how, how race, if you would, um, or the intersection of race and other identities um, has informed your navigating and managing of the critique of your leadership, um, both in ACPA and in higher education. So we've got about three or four minutes for that before we move to our last piece. So just a couple of voices. Um, I'll, I'll chime in because mm -hmm. um, I think that race is at the center of how I deal with critique. And that is that, um, I was one of those young people who internalized all those negative images about immigrants and Latinos. So when I transformed those negative images and let go and became myself, I actually didn't give a crap about critiques. And so, and as someone who was at the forefront during the NASPA ACPA vote, there was a lot of critique. Um, <laughs> so um, you do develop a thick skin. Uh, as part of that. And so I, I do think for me dealing with that is very much associated with my identity as a Latina. Mm -hmm. So um, building off of those points, I, I, something that I think I'm wrestling with or thinking about in relationship to this question is, um, is who did the critiques come from? Um, so I think that's, that's often the, a thing that I ask myself. So um, I think it's so rare in our, in our um, organizations that we, um, so Vasi's point about a, a shade less offensive I, is really sticking with me in part because we often, we often do things to the benefit of people in positions of power, right? So for example, we soften our language around race and racism. We use prejudice or bigotry or discrimination because if we say white supremacy, white folks will respond negatively or we would become defensive or resistant. Um, and I, I think so much of our time is sometimes is spent as leaders of color in trying to make ourselves palatable to white folks. Or, and, and I think to me what, um, what I've really appreciated about um, 
the, strate the strategic imperative, and I think some of the work that you all have articulated today as well, is sometimes we need to prioritize the needs of communities of color um, in really bold and transformative ways because they also get to be seen and get to be made visible, um, even if it means that we get pushback from certain people because they think, oh, what's happening with, with our association or I'm not being represented in the ways that I used to be. Um, and so I think some of those critiques are sometimes valid. And I also think I am more concerned, I think, these days with creating spaces and communities where folks of color can thrive and can dream and can imagine together, because I think that is often rare in our experiences. Um, and so I think to me, that's, that's my, my answer here is like, I pay attention to like the critiques. And so for example, the critique from native Aboriginal indigenous folks, I listened to that critique because that meant those are, that's a group of folks who are often invisible in, in higher education on our campuses. Like they're often seen as an asterisk, like they're not counted on surveys because their numbers are too small. So I didn't want to contribute to further making them invisible. So that was a valid critique that I wanted to do something about. But critiques around, um, you know, I am a white cisgender man and somehow this association doesn't feel the same as it was when you weren't president. I'm less interested in that in part because it means that I'm choosing to center voices and identities that have not been at the table previously. Um, and so I think to me, that's like an important piece that I often think about. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we, we are coming close to our, our, our time and really do want, did want to have an opportunity for folks to give, give last um, or remarks or, or thoughts. So um, this, as we have uh, kind of navigated this space today, uh, the, the comment from Vasti around being able to develop thick skin, um, you know, we have to, you know, be willing to take the hard knocks, you know, as Anne named, that's what Amel Hardy um, was willing to do at that beginning. So, oh, no, 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 we won't, we won't be doing this. We won't, we won't be going there, right? ACPA um, did stuff with Atlantic City, ACPA did stuff um, in terms of us moving out of um, Arizona, and so many other things. But those are markers of us being willing to take a stand, right? And such is the strategic imperative around racial justice and decolonization, and whose voice are we willing to center in this discussion? Um, and uh, so, and particularly given our identities as folks of color, what comes at us, um, not only from outside, but also from within and expectations that we have to manage. And so the, the power and the emotional labor and the energy that um, our identities bring in this discussion, I think has been a very important and powerful piece. What would you say as we wrap up um, this, this uh, opportunity, uh, any inspiring thoughts or as we think of the work to be done in the future, um, uh, as we uh, offer wisdom to other minoritized folks, particularly minoritized folks by race, um, and as we offer um, words of wisdom and inspiration to the profession, what's ahead? And so about a minute, a person, um, and uh, we'll start in honoring of that with, again, our first, if that feels okay, and what would you want to say to the folks? And a very active member in ACPA, I never felt that it was that that, that was that racism was, was was present or that it influenced what the reactions to my leadership. I never felt that, and I think this speaks to the quality of people that who we who we hire, who we employ. In the, in the field of student affairs. I think that we've got good people. We've got good people. What they have to deal with, of course, is what goes on in colleges and universities that might, that, that is, that tends to be racist or which tends to lead to colonization. But I believe that we have, we have attracted over the years a set of 
good people, rational people, thoughtful people who have made ACPA what it is today and that we need to cultivate and we need to listen to each other. We need to listen to each other and make sure that we are not overlooking those opportunities uh, or overlooking those barriers that have been created in society that keep the development of students from, from moving forward. Done. My mentor has said it all, and when she was talking about choosing the right people, uh, the word that popped into my head was lineage. Here we have an example of that, and as we who believe in and love and cherish the values and uh, history of ACPA mentor and invite people in, they clearly have been people who are like we are and who embrace and work on those values. The other thing that uh, is clear to me is that uh, having looked at this in a historical uh, perspective or with an historical perspective, that we're on track because when I was talking a while ago about the uh, conventions in Atlantic City and in New Orleans, the fact of the matter is that we went to those places, but we went there compromising uh, with them on allowing their misbehavior, uh, misanthropy to stay in place. If, if I'm not mistaken, somebody might correct me on this, but I think that when we went to uh, New Orleans as part of APGA, that the negotiation was that they put up bail bond in case any of our members uh, got into any difficulties with the local authorities that they would be able to be immediately out of custody. I see Dr. Pruitt nodding her head yes. So, <laughs> And that's very good because uh, the alternative is, as we said, then there was Arizona, and we don't have to compromise. We're not coming because of your values. So uh, I think if we stay on the beat, as the new book that I saw yesterday, uh, What Doesn't Kill You Make You Blacker, uh, mm. What Doesn't Kill Us Makes Us Stronger as an association. And I think that we have done it. Excellent. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. All right. Greg? I think the, we've heard from Ann and Harold, and as I think about everything that's been said and I think about the future, although I don't want to get political, ACPA and, and each of us have got to find a way to stop what's going on and the reversal. Uh, I think we've got to also look at ourselves and say, why is it just Vosti who's been a uh, Latin president? Or why is it that uh, any one of us, what, what do we bring, uh, Paul, others, we, we're, we're going to have to stand up again and uh, let the world know and let our profession know. Again, being on a college campus, when I watch some of the young people uh, and their uh, total disregard for humanity and uh, respect and dignity of the human person, uh, the things that started ACPA, I think it's time to bring them back to the forefront. Um, and it's very disturbing, very disturbing to me. What I hear students say to each other, what I see them uh, engage, and unfortunately, they can find support beyond the campus for those behaviors. Uh, so how do, we, how do we as a profession raise those issues again uh, and support them? But I think it's collaboration that's going to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Paul. <clears throat> well, I agree with everybody that's spoken thus far. And I think that the passion of our association around just social justice and, and inclusion 
is something that will always be a hallmark and we should continue it and move forward. Um, I wish our current leaders and our future leaders the best of luck. Um, times are tough, as Greg has mentioned, and, and I know from what I read on college campuses that the conversations have become much more shrill in many respects. So to, to promote um, inclusion and, and social justice and individual dignity, I think is important, and I'm glad that our association is doing that. Great. Thank you. Voss? You know, in, in many ways, ACPA is a microcosm of higher education society. Um, and uh, one of the things that is happening right now in society is the attack on the narrative and value of higher education. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that reflected in the criticisms of ACPA and the narratives that go around about that criticism. Um, I, I am concerned about the future uh, because I don't think we're uh, creating a compelling counter narrative to um, these false statements um, and overly simplistic uh, analysis of how students will succeed, which create uh, metrics that really hurt students of color and underrepresented students. So I am concerned. Um, I think ACPA has the right values to address this, but I think there's continuing vexing problems that we have to work on. Thank you. Steven. So I think for me, the, the thing that I spend a lot of time, I a lot of time these days thinking about is I'm, I'm concerned about um, the high levels of burnout that um, student affairs professionals um, face. Um, like I often, I, I talk with graduate students who, who have graduated who are in second or third year of their position and have chosen to leave the profession because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's too hard or they are working too many hours for little pay. Um, and so that's something that I worry about around the longevity of our, of our profession. Um, to what extent are we enabling young professionals to be able to take care of themselves and to not experience such early burnout? Um, I also think <laughs> we as uh, it, it are sometimes not the best models for that either. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think how do we sort of as model what that looks like um, so, so that folks also understand that it's okay for them to pause and, 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 and take time for themselves. So I think that's, that's something that I, that I think about and I think it's, it's gonna have a long-term impact on our profession because um, we can't, the ways in which we're existing currently are not sustainable. Um, people are not healthy, they're sick often, they're burned out, um, all of these pieces that I worry about that makes choosing student affairs not a, um, an exciting or, or, or meaningful profession for many, for many of our students. And so that's something that I am thinking about. Um, I wanna say thank you to everyone. And I guess my last comments are, again, as we hold all the wisdom through the generations and the years that are represented um, on this panel, um, I want us to acknowledge the power of voice and the power of experience, um, the power of agency, and um, allow ourselves to just sit with um, uh, the Ann Pruitts and the Harold Cheatham's in our profession, as well as sit with um, the Stephen Quays, so that as we bring together this cross-generational wisdom and knowing that there is such power in, um, uh, in that uh, and not writing off one is right or more wrong. Uh, the, the, um, what I love the name folks is this work didn't start with us and it won't end with us. Um, so I am in this space recognizing and honoring the shoulders that I stand on um, as we as we do this work and honoring those who I will pass the torch to as I sit down. Um, so it's just a wonderful, powerful thing for us to be together. 
Um, I'm excited to have been a part of this project and wish all of you um, continued leadership, wisdom, contribution, success, and our association will benefit greatly from this piece of work. Thanks so much for being a part of it. Uh, thank you, Chris Moody, for your leadership in helping us uh, to capture this. And uh, you all be blessed and well. <laughs>